Hello everyone, this is Nemea Wantang with Family Travel Africa. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, welcome to our channel if this is your first time watching. Today's topic is going to be one of probably the most requested uh, questions I've had, and we're going to cover how to deal with jet lag. For those who do frequent travel or international travel for that matter, um, going through time zones can really mess us up. Uh, mess us up in the sense that uh, with jet lag disorder, you can experience daytime fatigue, irritability, um, your whole circadian rhythm can be thrown off to where uh, you're having GI issues. Some people actually complain of having a, a belly ache, um, nausea. Um, for some, it is, it is as simple as sleeping in a few days to catch up. And some people actually take weeks, depending on how long and how far they traveled, uh, to get over these symptoms. With most travel, when we come back home, we are expected to hit the ground running, especially if you're a parent. Uh, your kids need you to get them back in a rhythm. If you are one of those last minute travelers like myself, we try to squeeze out every last minute from our vacations and come in on a Sunday and running to school and work on a Monday. Jet lag becomes a real problem. And this is very important, especially for kids. Um, going to school, they can have poor concentration and um, there's no uh, upside to uh, coming back from a vacation and then having a crummy week. So I'm gonna share some tips that have worked for our family and some that uh, we don't particularly use, but could be of help uh, for, for those parents out there and for the adults out there who do a lot of traveling. Most adults by now, if you've traveled enough, you know what works for you. But uh, just stay tuned. Um, we're gonna start talking about what uh, adults can do, but definitely incorporate for kids to toddlers, uh, school age kids, babies as well, um, toward the end of our talk here. So um, I would love to know uh, what you all do as well uh, when you travel. So now that we have defined jet lag as being this physiologic disorder, um, that uh, can manifest and, or be expressed with different symptoms depending on uh, the individual and how far and where you traveled. Um, it is well known and understood that jet lag is worse traveling uh, eastward, so going from west to east. In our case, uh, say we just uh, left Panama City, Florida, and we went to Nairobi, Kenya. That was an eastward uh, travel, and so you experience more jet lag going in that direction um, than you would coming back from Nairobi uh, to the US. So uh, going to Asia, worse on, on the jet lag symptoms. Um, coming back from Asia, not so much. And it has to do with the fact that coming back or traveling westward, we actually gain time. Um, meanwhile, going eastward, you lose time. And uh, losing time is obviously worse on our circadian rhythm um, because you, you have less time to catch up and, and get into a rhythm. So um, that's, that's one thing to think about. The other thing that uh, affects how we deal with jet lag is the number of time zones we cross. So the more time zones, obviously the worse the jet lag. And it is estimated that uh, going from west to east, you can expect an extra day to catch up per time zone. Um, and then, of course, going back west, which is easier on the body, it's about half the time. Um, so if you cross through four time zones uh, going eastward, uh, you can expect four days uh, if you did nothing as far as catching up. But if you go four time zones from east to west, it could take you as little as two days, even if you did nothing to help the process of catch up. So uh, there's the difference uh, between time zones and why jet lag even happens. So let's talk about tips and things we can do to help with that jet lag. So when we talk about the tips or recommendations to deal with jet lag, uh, these tips and recommendations are really uh, based around the cues. So uh, what makes the circadian rhythm the circadian rhythm in that time zone has to do with 
your meals, your activity, social engage engagement, uh, light exposure. Um, and, and so if you think about it, a lot of what we would recommend or anyone would recommend will uh, affect those things. And uh, if you are doing air travel, which most of us do through time zones, uh, you have a pressurized cabin um, and it is thought in the pressurized cabin, there's actually research to support that um, you get decreased blood flow. So there's less uh, blood or oxygen in your blood, um, let's say. Um, so with the decreased oxygen in your blood, you can, and decreased activity um, and thrown off meal schedules, you get dehydrated, um, you get uh, a, a change um, in, in your rhythm. And so there are a lot more reasons uh, for, for jet lag, especially with air travel. All right, so how can we deal with this? How can we combat or conquer our jet lag? The first thing that uh, you would want to do um, is to try to adjust to that new time zone. So trying to adjust to the new time zone may include a variety of different things. So in simulating that time zone, um, your meals would be around the time that you would eat in that time zone. Um, your sleep will be around that time as well. Some people, not me, some people are super uh, proactive with this. They plan ahead. They actually change their sleep patterns and their meals and their activities um, a, a few days before international travel to make it easier on them. I just haven't been able to do that. Um, not for myself, not for, not for the kids, but it, it definitely does help if you're one of those super planners and you can get it done because of your flex, you know, flexible schedule or, or whatever, go ahead and do that. That is definitely uh, going to help. The second thing I would recommend is um, preparing, when you're preparing for that uh, trip, especially with kids, you want to simulate what they're already used to. So keeping routines as you're going through time zones. So being on the plane um, means that if you would be sleeping at a certain time in your new time zone, you want to go ahead and get comfortable and get ready for sleep. So um, we tend to take night flights. Um, night flights are the best. Um, traveling with babies and toddlers who nap is also easier because you can try to work naps in and actually help them deal with the changes in the time zone. I will tell my older kids when we are traveling on that night flight, wear something comfortable. In addition to your change of clothes, get, get some slack, something that you, you know, feel like you can sleep in easily. Um, there are um, eye masks that help. There are earplugs that help. Anything like even your travel pillows, um, anything that would help simulate or, or, or get you to sleep um, when you need to, even if you're not tired, uh, definitely helps that process. Speaking of falling asleep, a lot of times it is easier and the kids love international travel where they can get on those screens and watch the show that they've been waiting and never you know, got a chance to. But what I um, have found is uh, turning those shows off at the right time obviously helps. It's even easier if we the parents do it with them. So say, hey, you know, this is our bedtime. Um, we'll just take a short nap. And that means I've turned my screen off. They've turned their screens off. We're doing it together. Um, it is harder for some kids uh, than, than others. And this should definitely not be something that you're hard and fast with. Uh, there's no point ruining the experience of flying together or starting your vacation on the bad foot because you're insisting on an early bedtime while in the plane. But that's something to consider if you're able to do it especially with the younger kids, um, babies and toddlers. If you're taking uh, long flights, uh, say you have a layover, I actually encourage layovers. It's a little tricky now traveling in COVID times uh, because there are some layovers that may be too long and uh, can throw off the uh, validity of your COVID test. And so it may not be worth it if you can't find a decent short layover. But if you can, um, layovers or stopovers 
uh, are a nice way to kind of recharge, especially if you're able to walk around the airport, get in some, some uh, uh, sunlight um, or, or participate in activities that will kind of wake you up and, and get you into that time zone. Or um, in some cases, I would say, uh, I think we traveled with Air Maroc um, about a year ago going to Cameroon and uh, our flight left from uh, Dulles International Airport and we went from Dulles to uh, Casablanca and uh, from Casablanca to Douala. Now uh, Casablanca our layover was super long it was over it was about 20 hours and so we took advantage of that to actually do a tour of the city, you know, we went ahead and pre-booked it because we knew that's how long our um, our uh, layover would be. And this was right before the uh, COVID pandemic. So, you know, we're talking January of 2020. And so Air Maroc was ever so gracious and you will find a lot of uh, airlines do this where they will put you up in a nice uh, free hotel with uh, room and meals covered and we took advantage of that um, and and went ahead and got a day tour uh, with the family and it was great because having the hotel also allowed us to get some rest in get some meals in get some activity in um, so look 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 when you're traveling if you're having those options for layovers and this time I definitely wouldn't recommend a layover that's uh, uh, that long um, but of course, uh, if you have the chance for a layover, use that opportunity to catch up um, or slow down, depending on which direction of travel um, you're having. I already touched on the meals that you uh, would want to time and the snacks that you uh, would want to have during travel. Um, I did talk about the risk of dehydration um, and inactivity, muscle cramps. Of course, long flights, there's also a real risk for blood clots, particularly as we get older. Um, so unfortunately, it has been my recent experience that we cannot walk the aisles like we used to. Um, so that, that layover helps get you some activity. Um, but the other thing I would encourage, highly encourage, is drinking lots of water. Lots of water, staying hydrated. I often find myself now boosting on vitamins um, and uh, I do tend to eat a little healthier around my travel uh, just to keep my immune system going uh, but staying hydrated is going to be super important to uh, prevent those uh, cramps but also staying hydrated has been shown to help um, adjusting to different time zones uh, some folks will uh, go ahead and consume caffeine to stay up uh, I personally, you know, I like tea, I will drink some tea, but I, I, I just haven't uh, subscribed to the idea of consuming uh, high doses of caffeine, uh, which I otherwise normally do. Um, I just wouldn't do that on, on a long flight. For some folks, and, and studies have actually shown that getting about 300 milligrams of caffeine um, helps you adjust as far as staying up you just want to make sure you're timing it right and um, it doesn't uh, last too long because then you run into another problem same thing with alcohol um, a lot of folks will have alcohol on the plane kind of help relax them probably you know uh, help fall asleep uh, when they would want to but then again caffeine alcohol these can dehydrate you kind of work against the process so just drink water <laughs> as much as i don't uh, drink enough, I will say, drink water. Another uh, tip I came across that I would like to share, this is not something that I have done myself, but taking a nice warm bath before you get on the plane for a night flight is a nice way to calm yourself down. Everyone knows a nice hot shower or warm bath uh, can help. It probably relaxes the muscles. Also for babies, this is huge. I actually would do this before a night flight with my kids uh, when they were babies. I give them a nice warm bath, get them in their um, onesie or, or snuggle them in a, in a nice comfortable PJ, 
get them uh, what they usually eat at night before we travel. And um, even if they had a favorite snacks, pack those too. Uh, you want to you want to keep them as comfortable. Um, they need to notice uh, the change the least in their environment. Now let's talk about light therapy because um, natural light is what the circadian rhythm is all about. You know, it keeps us going. Um, even when we change time zones, we are thrown off if we uh, get that natural light at uh, a time that we're not used to or a period we're not used to. So we can use this to our advantage. Uh, when you are traveling, uh, going through time zones, if you have the opportunity uh, to open the shades uh, when you need the light, close the shades in the plane when you don't need the light, um, that is uh, only, only going to, to help. Um, there is uh, the situation where you can actually get a light box. Um, I personally own a light box. I have never used my light box um, traveling through time zones. I uh, had this light box uh, when I lived in Washington State. Uh, felt like for four months out of the year, we got a nice uh, seasonal uh, daylight where we would actually have sunrise at a decent time and sunset at a decent time. And then for the rest of the eight months, it was, you know, 8 a.m. before the sun, you know, would, would peak out and then 4 p.m. the sun was setting. And so uh, for some people, they would get a light box. Um, I got a light box, you know, uh, as far as what it did for me, I would turn it on um, earlier as soon as I got up in the morning and try to get some of that natural light uh, out of the light box uh, before I went to work. Um, I was a resident at the time, you know, so before I went into the hospital, I do that um, every morning and I did it for about three months out of the year and, and that was it. So for the three years I was out there, I used it. Now you can use this to your advantage when you are traveling through time zones and I will share with you what uh, my light box looks like. So here's my light box. It's uh, actually pretty nifty. I bought it online years ago and you can see it's called Lightbook. It works still very well. I will not shine the light in your eyes, but you can see it will get super bright. Um, I'm going to plug it in now just so you see the intensity of it and share that with you. So it's all plugged in and super bright. almost paranormal bright um, but plug it out the beauty about this light book is you can see um, there is a plug to it but you charge the battery and you don't have to plug it in so wherever you go um, once the battery is charged which it is not right now um, you can use it it comes with a really nice case over here and it just fits right in here like so <laughs> it looks like a tablet. Down here is where you would put your charger. And so, yeah, um, that's uh, a good option. Uh, for folks who have cataracts, um, it's not recommended. Um, these bright lights may not be someone who suffers from a seizure disorder, um, someone who suffers from migraines that could be triggered by such light, um, or someone who uh, deals with bipolar disorder. So please, before you do anything, uh, double check with your doctor, make sure that that is a great option for you. Now here's uh, the question of the session. Uh, should I use melatonin when I am going through time zones? Does it help me fall asleep? Can I give some to my kids? Well, um, yes and no. <laughs> Melatonin is fairly safe uh, when used in low doses uh, for adults. So anything uh, between three, any dose between three and five milligrams uh, is considered generally safe to take. Um, however, I do not recommend it for uh, kids or uh, infants without the consent of their doctor. Um, melatonin in short uh, time frame, so you know, taking it for a couple of days does does not tend to be an issue. 
However, uh, our bodies do produce our own melatonin. And remember that even if you did nothing, your body will slowly uh, adjust to your new time zone. So taking melatonin for an extended amount of time is actually not recommended um, and uh, could be uh, of, of more disadvantage and less uh, benefit um, to, to you. So yes, if, if you must, low doses for adults between three milligrams and five milligrams tends not to be uh, an issue and actually can help. I've never uh, resorted to it. Um, I just try to use all the other, other tips, but um, there's the answer. It has not been recommended in infants, so I wouldn't uh, uh, go that far unless the pediatrician thinks that is a great idea, which I'm not too sure about. Um, and let's talk about the last thing. This has to do with our babies, uh, our, our toddlers. I uh, made a recommendation recently for a friend of mine traveling to always make sure, if possible, call the airlines and see if you can get seating where you are able to use a bassinet. So the airlines typically provide uh, a, a bassinet um, unless they run out. I, I guess that can happen if you just have uh, that many uh, infants on the flight. However, the bassinet has to fit um, on the divider or the wall of the divider. So that row behind the divider where you would either have a galley or a water closet toilet um, or another class like business class or first class, there's that divider. In that divider is typically where you have the hooks for your uh, infant or uh, baby bassinet. And so you can request the row that comes uh, right after that. And that way you're right where your kid is. Um, and that uh, bassinet is great, especially if you have a lap infant. Having the bassinet means that the lap if it isn't on your lap all the time. Um, I would still pack uh, their blankets, their you know squishy toys, like whatever it is that they typically sleep with. You want to try to make it um, as comfortable and as familiar as possible. Um, one of the things that uh, you may not uh, be able, when you may not be able to use the uh, bassinet is if there's turbulence. So they will take that, take that down um, right before uh, landing and obviously um, at takeoff. You, you can't uh, use those. Um, so they will, they will actually come in and take those off. Other than that, um, it is great to have the infant bassinet um, and tend to uh, have kids, I think it says up to 20 kilos, but actually that's probably 20 pounds, sorry, um, 10 kilos. So 22 pounds. Um, and so that, that bassinet is a great option. Again, I've listed a bunch of tips for you. I hope uh, you find them helpful, useful, and uh, try them out. I think the key to all of this is finding what works for you. So um, going through uh, the different um, options uh, and finding a routine, uh, depending on where you're traveling and um, um, which way you're traveling. So again, thanks for watching. If you like uh, uh, what we've shared today, please give us a thumbs up. We love the likes, but also share. And um, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for watching. This is Nemea Wantang, Family Travel Africa, coming to you on a day off, which is exciting when you don't have to go into the hospital. Um, but I will be there tomorrow. So anyhow, um, thanks for watching. Until next time, bye-bye. I hope you like my video. Yes, you do. Subscribe.